good morning, everybody, or I guess good, good afternoon. I'm in Washington, D.C. right now, so uh, I'm not sure what time it is, to be honest with you. Uh, today, we're going to talk about tomato disease management. Uh, we're probably going to focus more on disease that you might see in the home garden, but uh, we also see them in commercial fields. Uh, I've been in Auburn for 30 years. I'm an extension plant pathologist, so I work with plant diseases, work with uh, vegetables, tree fruits, small fruit, uh, soybeans, and corn, and a few other crops, so... Uh, well versed. First, I wanted to show you a slide of healthy looking tomatoes. Um, this is what you're supposed to be growing. And these are the last slide you'll see of, of healthy tomatoes during my talk. I'm always spending a lot of time looking at tomatoes that just don't look all that right. One of the more common diseases we see in the home garden is, is uh, Fusarium wilt. Um, it's a soil borne fungal disease, very common. Uh, stays in the soil for long periods of time. We see it more in home gardens than we do in commercial fields because you have a lot of heirloom varieties being planted that don't have resistance to this pathogen. Uh, oftentimes you'll see a yellowing on a few plants in the garden. It might be unilateral, so maybe just half the plant is yellowing up. Uh, but eventually after a week or two, those plants will uh, slowly wilt and die. And if you were to cut open the stem at the soil line, you'll see a brown uh, discoloration in, in the vascular system, the, the, basically the water conducting vessels just underneath the, the bark, if you will, but right at the soil line and heading into the crown. So the soil-borne pathogen, Fusarium, will invade the roots. It uh, survives in the soil for many years. It has some resting spores. Uh, once it gets inside to get water conducting vessels, it'll block them up, both the spores and mycelium, which eventually causes the plant to wilt and die but it, it can take a week or two for this to occur. Um, you can see some examples of there in Foley and also uh, more locally in Auburn. And the easiest, easiest way to identify it is, uh, you won't see any outer symptoms we saying is the yellowing, but uh, slice that stem open horizontally just above the soil line, about six inches down into the crown, and you'll see that brown discoloration stand out. And that, Typically means uh, fusarium wilt. Sometimes we have a disease called verticillium wilt, which I call it's fusarium's uh, Yankee cousin, but I don't see that as often in Alabama as fusarium. Here's a variety trial and hopefully you could tell which variety was not resistant to fusarium. Uh, but the best control is the use of fusarium wilt resistant cultivar. There are many of these on the market. Also plant in well-drained soils. You can use a crop rotation system to avoid infested areas, but uh, that's always a wise thing to do for many of your soil-borne diseases. You'd also use grafted plants, say heirloom varieties on resistant rootstock, which is becoming more popular. And someone like Andre De Silva or our old Joe Kimball would be a good one to ask about that. But the resistant varieties would be the best way to go. Most cost-effective for sure. Uh, another will disease that we see is caused by a different type of uh, biotic pathogen, a bacterium, and uh, that's bacterial wilt. And that's a soil-borne bacterial disease that invades the plants also through the roots, also survives long periods of time in the soil. Usually we should see it though in very saturated soils, very wet years we'll see this. Um, it also plugs up the water vessels and you'll get a rapid wilting of the plant. Typically what this will go without uh, the yellowing that we see with fusarium. That oftentimes helps in field diagnosis. If you look inside the plant stem, you'll see a, a discoloration, much like we sh I showed you with fusarium uh, in the vascular system. But oftentimes this will uh, move into the, the center pith, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, what we'll do in the lab, Dr. Cassie Connor, our diagnostician, will uh, do an ooze test, bacterial ooze test, one of my favorite things I've learned in plant pathology over many years, but we'll take that, that wilt, that discolored stem, stick it in a glass of water, give it about 30 seconds to a minute. And if it's bacterial wilt, you'll see this white milky strands of ooze streaming out of the brown area on that stem. And that's a positive test for bacterial wilt. And we probably do that about a dozen times in the lab at Auburn. And every time we do it, we were fascinated by it. But that's a home testing for bacterial wilt. Uh, so the best control, if you have a problem, and many times you see this in low-lying areas and saturated soils, uh, you get plant susceptible crops in, more, in a, a 
I, I would only plant uh, susceptible crops in, uh, in infested areas maybe once every four years. We have, have an area that has a history of it. Uh, commercial growers can try soil fumigation, home gardeners, soil solarization to help eliminate the pathogen to some point. Uh, we, we do have new resistant varieties coming online, such as BHN uh, 669 and Tropic Boy. And these are just recent additions to our arsenal. And you also could try grafted plants on resistant rootstock. That's a, basically a new technique over the last five years or so. Let's move into the foliar diseases, which are I'll say more common, but more easily recognized. But the first one, this is the first one I saw when I came to Alabama was early blight, uh, caused by the fungus known as alternaria. And uh, oftentimes people will talk about their tomatoes firing up from the bottom. I wasn't sure what they were talking about when I first got them, got here, but I, I realized it was early blight and it's a fungal disease that starts in the older leaves, mature leaves at the base of the plant, and then moves up the plant, firing it up, causing those leaves to die. That's not natural. That's not a natural thing to do. That's a pathogen. And what we'll see is these target-like lesions off to the right, oftentimes surrounded by a yellow halo. Oftentimes you'll see it on tom uh, tomato plants that are uh, suffering from nitrogen deficiency as well. So plants under stress. It's caused by a uh, fungal pathogen uh, that overwinters and plant debris in the soil. So if you leave your tomato plants in the garden or in the field during the winter, and if you had alternaria last year or, or uh, early blight last year, you're going to have it again this year. You can also enter fields on air currents from a neighbor's yard or from down the road. Um, it begins on older leaves as at regular spots that then enlarge up to about a half inch in diameter. And they have that target-like pattern, concentric ring pattern. And typically you'll see a yellow halo surrounding these lesions. And it's favored by warm weather and wet conditions. So I think ideal temperatures are between 75 and 85 degrees. Uh, free moisture, either from rain or from overhead irrigation will also push it along. It can go to the fruit. And I, typically I work with commercial growers and they're picking their fruit at the breaker stage when those tomatoes are just turning pink. So you don't normally see the, the fruit rot stage, but in home gardens, more likely you're seeing this type of reaction where you have these concentric rings on the fruit themselves. Uh, in the field, you can get the foliation, severe defoliation. I'll show you a slide in a second, which can't, because you're eliminating the leaves in the photosynthetic area, it'll reduce fruit size and fruit quality. You can see sun scald in the, on that fruit in the bottom right because the foliage is gone, can't protect the fruit from the sun's rays. And I've seen up to 50% yield reduction in commercial fields in the absence of a fungicide when the disease was at its full strength. Uh, we used to do a lot of fungicide trials up in the Coleman area back in the 90s. Uh, on the left, you can see uh, uh, somebody using Bravo, which is like dithane, a, a chlorothalonil protectant fungicide. Oftentimes, commercial growers will put on a protectant fungicide once a week, beginning uh, three to seven days after transplanting and continuing up through harvest. Uh, if they don't, they'll run into to, uh, what you see on the far right which is where there's no fungicide. And if you can see early blights taking out about 85% of that foliage. Uh, you'll get 45, 50% yield reduction. They're still putting on some fruit, but they're not gonna look all that good. And you're not gonna pick as many as you would like. So uh, under the right conditions, wet weather, where this is, this, and you notice this disease through scouting that it's beginning to develop, you need to get on a program to try and prevent uh, its rapid development. So as far as disease control, uh, look at your transplants. I'll talk more about this with a couple other diseases, but uh, make sure you don't see any lesions that might indicate early blight or some of these other foliar diseases I'll talk about. There are a few early blight resistant or tolerant varieties that are available. Uh, some of these still might need to uh, be treated with a fungicide in, in severe cases or uh, favorable weather conditions. Follow, some, follow a balanced fertility program, avoid excessive overhead irrigation, I would scout for a disease weekly. Uh, if you're a home gardener, you're probably out there every day. So take a peek down at the lower leaves and see what you see. And if you see signs of early blight, you might think about a fungicide spray program. And again, these might be about a seven day program, seven to 10 days program, depending on the weather conditions. Hot and dry, you could extend that program outwards. Uh, warm and wet, you might have to tighten it up to that seven day window. 
And then remove diseased tomato residue after harvest if you do have the disease problem. Uh, you could bury it or just, um, just put it in the garbage. Another disease that we sometimes see is target spot on tomato. I do a lot of work with this disease on soybeans because it does have a very large host range, but it also produces uh, target light lesions that maybe not as dramatic as I see with early blight. But similar pattern where it starts uh, low in the plant and moves up, it, it'll cause these brown to black lesions with a subtle concentric ring pattern. Uh, can be confused with early blight, and it's possible that you get both diseases on the same plant, so it can get quite confusing out in the field. Favored by high humidity and free moisture, Temperatures between 70 and 94 degrees will favor target spots, so a little, more, little bit higher than we see with early blight. Very broad host range. Uh, we have specialists working on it with cotton. I work with the same disease on soybeans, uh, but it does love tomatoes as well. I think that's the same picture on the left, but you can see those faint target-like lesions on the left can also go to the fruit uh, and be a problem. So the longer you have those fruit in the field, the more likely these diseases will go to the fruit, obviously, the longer they're exposed. Uh, with target spot, you can rotate fields to avoid carryover residue from one year to the next. Uh, you can just try to eliminate that residue just by burying it. Maybe, maybe a hot compost pile would help. Uh, eliminate volunteers and weeds, especially those that are, that are in the solanaceous family, the potato family, like such as potatoes and peppers. They can act as a reservoir source for this pathogen. Start with clean, healthy transplants that you purchase at, at a center that you, you have had luck with in the past. Proper soil fertility, avoid excessive over irrigation, and then apply fungicides preventively when conditions favor disease development. A lot of these foliar diseases, if you wait for the disease to move halfway through the canopy before you spray, uh, you're just throwing away your money. So you want to spray early when you first see it or when weather conditions favor it to try and get ahead of these problems. Bacterial spots is a significant problem. I'm probably, we probably see more of this than just about anything. And statewide, and what you'll get is these little chocolate brown lesions on the leaves. And sometimes you see it just a slight yellow halo around it. This is bacterial spot. And it's often introduced on transplants. You can't overwinter on residue, but I think it's more coming in on transplants. It attacks the leaves and the fruit. Uh, favored by warm, wet conditions as well. You see a pattern there. Uh, the leaf spots are irregular and quite ragged. And I'll show a picture of that as well. And you also get fruit spots that can be raised and scabby. Uh, so it's not a pretty disease once the disease gets going. On the left are classic symptoms where you see somewhat of an angular type lesions to the uh, bacterial spot lesions because the bacteria, once it gets inside the leaf tissue, it has a harder time crossing some of these major veins. So you can see these sharp angles to it which sometimes I use in the field to, to help do a little quick field diagnosis. Starts in the lower leaves, moves up. In the laboratory, we also do an ooze test. We can take that leaf on the left, just cut a, cut a slice open with a razor blade and stick it underneath a microscope. And the, those bacteria, those thousands of cells will be oozing out of that brown tissue, which is a, just a quick and dirty method in the lab to confirm that you have bacterial spot. Same disease on peppers. and. Uh, bell peppers. Unfortunately, with peppers, we have resistant varieties available, but tomatoes we do not at this point uh, that I'm aware of. Oftentimes, you'll see the lesions uh, form more at the tip of the leaf as moisture moves the bacterial spores to the tips and they enter into the hydathodes or some of the stomates. But it's usually a bottom to top type progression on a plant. And it also goes to the fruits. So you get these, these scabby lesions on uh, tomatoes somewhat sunken, and as they progress, they get pretty nasty looking crater-like. Peppers, oftentimes you'll see a bump on the fruit, like a scabby, like a little mini volcano, but obviously that's not gonna be very uh, sellable on the marketplace, or you're gonna probably not wanna give those to your neighbors. So bacterial spot. Best thing to do is avoid transplants. And if you're buying your transplants from uh, a nursery or a store, just look for them closely. This is one I bought in Montgomery about 20 years ago. And it had, you just see a couple of brown lesions on that picture on the right. 
on a couple of leaves. And that was, I bought that plant. That's how I spend my weekends at the garden centers looking for disease. But that, that I did an ooze test and it had bacterial spot. And that whole tray at the store was infected with the disease. So always examine your transplants before accepting delivery or, or buying them at the local market. Uh, best way to control, I think, this disease. Uh, other management tools, disease-free transplants I mentioned, avoid excessive overhead irrigation, uh, avoid working the garden or a field when it's wet. It's a, that's an easy way to move the bacterium and also knock off le microscopic leaf hairs that'll supply an opening for the bacterium to enter. Uh, we often recommend copper uh, mancoza, which is a fungicide, take mix combinations as the two products together seem to help uh, have a synergistic reaction to help reduce spot management. But now we're starting to see copper resistant bacterial spot populations in the Southeast. They're pretty, very common. I'm doing some work with one of our bacteriologists and uh, we're trying to figure out how much of our populations are resistant to copper and also if the pathogen may be overwintering on weeds around the fields and if that's more common of an introduction than just transplants, but possibly both. But uh, bacterial spots. Now, tomato spotted wilt's been around since about 1987. Uh, it's, uh, it's when we've first identified in Alabama. And this one is a virus disease, so a different type of pathogen. It's spread by uh, thrips insects, similar to aphids in a way. And what you'll see in the garden or in the field will be this uh, severe stunting of the plants, and somewhat abnormal growth. But the stunting usually gives it away. Most of your plants might look healthy, and then you have one or two plants that look kind of ugly. You'll get a terminal leaves will be distorted, may turn a pale green. Uh, the leaves you'll see a, a purple or bronzing to them. I'll show you a slide of that as well. Uh, you also can get ring spots on the fruit, which kind of look kind of cool to a pathologist, but not so much to a home gardener. Commercial growth. So you see bronzing on the foliage in the upper left. Uh, some of that, the little spots you see sometimes early in the season, I have to kind of recalibrate myself each year because I think it looks like bacterial spot, but You'll see this more in the upper canopy than in the lower leaves, but something that time the bronzing can be quite dramatic as you see in that one leaf and it can move down the petioles. Spread by Western flower thrips, which are often in the blossoms. And they, they, they just inject the, the virus during their feeding. Uh, if you let the fruit ripen up, and even if you don't, you can see these ring spots on the fruit, which would be a sign of, or a symptom of tomato spotted wilt virus. This is a disease that also goes to peanuts, so if you have peanut growers in your area or if you're in the wiregrass area, there's a good chance that disease couldn't, can't be moving back and forth between those crops. Uh, people ask me, if you, can you eat those fruit? Uh, I would welcome to eat them if you like, but they might not taste all that good because they're not ripening it up properly. But you're not going to come down with ring spots on your face or hands, but it is an interesting looking disease. And fortunately, over the last 10 years, we've had a lot of spotted wilt resistant varieties come onto the marketplace. Uh, some of these, like Amelia, uh, are available. Bella Rose, I see often. Uh, some of the BHN varieties, 602 and 640, uh, you can find at your local stores. Some of these others that are listed uh, may be off the market. I think Mountain Glory might just have come out recently. Uh, so look for resistant varieties, look for the tags. Uh, do some research on it. There are a couple of Roma types that have resistance as well if you're into that type of tomato. I also mentioned reflective mulches may reduce thrips feeding and effective weed control in and around the field may help reduce overwintering inoculum. Uh, but that's a little bit far to go. If, just, if you have this disease every year, go with a resistant variety. And that's much better than trying to spray an insecticide or using some of these cultural practices. So that's by the wilt on the left on tomatoes, uh, those fancy ring spots uh, in the center. That's just how we, uh, Dr. Connor would test for it in the lab. On the right is uh, Dr. Joe Kimball, one of our, our old regional extension agents. Uh, we were evaluating, looking for bacterial spot, different diseases in some of these transplant houses. And oftentimes the disease, these diseases can come in and oftentimes I'll see spotted wilt coming in on, on peppers later in the season. So always be aware of the diseases when you're picking up transplants. Nice way to avoid them. This is a disease southern blight that I think I probably see it more in commercial fields than I do in backyard garden, which is a good thing for home gardeners. Uh, 
major problem on a lot of crops. It's called Southern blight, another soil borne fungal disease that causes that white fungal growth on the stem or any basically any part plant part that's touching the soil. Soil borne tax over 1200 crops and weeds, uh, vegetable wise, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, snap beans are all susceptible to it as well as all your cucurbits. Uh, I often see this on watermelon and cantaloupe or pumpkin fruit that are touching the soil where this pathogen is present. So any organic matter that touches moist infested soil, this pathogen can take off and attack that, that uh, plant part. What you'll see is typically this white fungal growth at the base of the plant uh, near the stem line. And uh, what I'll see in commercial fields is that the disease will move down a row. So it doesn't usually, well, it doesn't usually take out a whole field. It might take out a whole small garden, but you'll see the, the disease moving from one plant to the next, maybe through irrigation water. This is on raised beds in a commercial field up on Sand Mountain, but you'll see it move from plant to plant. So sometimes you could, when you first see a plant wilting and the plants are usually, this usually starts to show up just as the plants are starting to put on fruit. You could remove that plant with the soil around its base and possibly slow the disease down. But if not, it'll just continue to move from plant to plant. So cross row spread is not as common. So you get a rapid wilting of the plants and then you get a crown rot. You get a black canker or discoloration at the stem line. Looks like it's been girdled. Uh, and the white mold under moist conditions will cover up that point at the, at the soil line. Eventually you'll get these small round sclerotia which form in the mycelium and those sclerotia are just little seed-like structures that is dormant mycelium of the fungus. And these could be white to orange, to tan, to reddish brown, to dark brown. And that's dormant mycelium. And it could survive in your soil for six, seven, eight years in the absence of a host. So once you get this disease, you're, you're, you're kind of in a, you're in a spot. It's not a good spot to be in. So I mentioned anything touching the ground. So if you have a, a foliar disease like early blight or, or a, Anything that knocks the leaves off, once those leaves hit the ground, it could stimulate the fungus in the soil to become active. Uh, you can see it on the peppers on the left that we had a problem with bacterial spot in that field and southern blight started attacking the fruit that were touching the ground. Cantaloupe on the right are just melting away due to southern blight on the right on infested moist soil. So uh, getting those plants up, maybe putting down a good mulch uh, or plastic would help reduce the problem. You will want to avoid low pH situations, which seems to uh, help stimulate the disease. Uh, rotate crops, but it does have a very wide host range. Uh, plant early before the summer heat sets in, because it does sort of like the, the heat of Alabama. So early plantings might do better than late in infested fields. Improve air circulation, good spacing between plants might be some, of some benefit. You can try to remove symptomatic plants quickly, plus the soil around the base to try and reduce it metalize it basically from, from spreading down that row. Uh, I don't like recommending deep tillage, but you can do this in certain situations to try and bury those sclerotia deeper than six inches deep in the soil. Uh, that fungus has a hard time moving back up to the soil surface, so you may uh, reduce the amount of inoculum going into the following year if you're planting tomatoes or peppers uh, continuously. Commercial growers can fumigate with a product like T-Lone C35 or Picclor. Uh, to help reduce the problem. Home gardeners, you're more, you might try soil solarization if you have a severe problem. Try this in the garden if you, and if we have a, a nice normal hot summer in Alabama with a lot of solarizing days that might reduce the amount of southern blight you have in that area. We're gonna finish up with nematodes, uh, microscopic roundworms, uh, most numerous animal on the face of the earth. Uh, more numerous than uh, insects, it's not as diverse, but. About 10% of nematodes are plant parasites that live in the soil and feed on the roots of plants. And we have about 10 or 12 different uh, damaging species in Alabama. They feed with a stylet, which is, you can see on the left. And that's sort of, uh, that, that's like a hypodermic needle. And they, they have muscles attached to the basal bulb of that stylet that allow the nematode to puncture root cells. And then they secrete enzymes that move into the cell, liquefy it basically, and then they reverse the flow and suck that out. And that's how they gain their nutrition and damage the plants. And, and you could find hundreds of nematodes in the soil. Um, some good, some bad, some are feeding around bacteria, some are 
uh, feeding on fungi. It's, they're a, it's a whole different world underneath the soil for sure. One you're mo mostly concerned with with tomatoes is root knot nematode. And it produces these large galls on the roots. It's not because you have a nematode the size of your thumb and nerve or size of a nickel. It's because you have multiple nematodes attacking that, that root. They're secreting enzymes in that case that increase the size of the cells around their head of the plant, increase the size of the cells of the plant at the host. And that's where they get their, as they set up their feeding site. And you might have multiple, you have multiple nematodes saying this infected, infected plant. So here you can see an adult female in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, they start off vermiform or worm-like, snake-like, but root knot will, will swell up into this bulbous form. This is an adult female, um, that large blob on top that looks like a dark cloud. That's uh, about 10% of their 250 eggs she produces in one generation uh, that are hatched immediately and those little juvenile nematodes swim off and attack other parts of the root or other plants. And those are just stained red so you can see them. But right around her head region, which is that pointy area on the bottom left is where she'll secrete enzymes. And then the cells around that head area increase in size and number, and that gives you those large gall roots in the bottom left. And you have a root system like that, it's not functioning properly. You're not gonna pick up moisture and nutrients, so you see plants wilting when they really shouldn't be. And you might see signs like nitrogen deficiency where the lower leaves are yellowing like you see on the, that slide on the right. So plants will show nitrogen deficiency, deficiency I'm sorry, uh, yellowing nutrient problems. And occasionally you'll see a plant die outright. Um, but you'll see that stunting and you might not see this right away. It's not, a, it's a disease we call it the hidden enemy because you don't see the nematodes, uh, but you do see the symptoms with, but you can't think, well, that's probably a nitrogen deficiency or drought. So every so often dig up a few plants if you see this and just look for these galls, which are pretty easy to detect and nothing else is gonna cause that on your tomatoes. As far as management, uh, first thing you wanna do if you're moving into a, a new home or a new field or a new garden area, Take a, semi, uh, a soil sample and have it inspected for nematodes. You probably want to do this in the best to do it in the fall because that's when the populations are at highest. Uh, nematode populations drop dramatically over the wintertime, especially a cold winter. So you want to sample in the fall. That's the best. And get about a pint of soil uh, from your garden area from different spots so you see what the population looks like. If you do have nematodes, you might want to choose a different area to go to or to plant. Um, if you had a history of nematodes, or if you do have them, you definitely want to go with a root knot resistant variety. Typically, these, these have N on the label, which stands for, for, for on root knot nematode resistance. Can reduce plant stress to the use of organic matters, uh, good compost. Sometimes uh, by doing this, you're adding antagonists, both fungi, bacteria, other nematodes that might attack that, that, that pathogen. Uh, sanitation at the end of the year, if you have root on nematodes, you can dig those plants up, but just leave the root system on the soil surface and let the sun beat down on it. And that will burn up the population to some extent. Uh, you can rotate. Uh, root now though has a very, has, I think it goes to over 3000 different holes. So it's rotation is a kind of a tough order there. Uh, suppressive crops, we do have a handout, uh, nematode suppressive crops and things like um, sesame seed, crotillaria, partridge pea, uh, certain marigold varieties that you can plant in a, in a nematode infested area. And they give off chemicals that will kill the, these nematodes or inhibit their reproduction. And that's an that's a, that's a option when you're, you have limited land space or limited garden space. But there is a handout on the ACES website. And then solarization is also a nice method to try and reduce populations. But, even with that, if everything works out perfectly, those nematodes are eventually gonna move back into that area as soil is moved around. But it is a way to, to knock populations down when, you're, when, you, when you have limited area to grow. Uh, I put this up, uh, I think I used this last year. This is a friend of mine, Dr. Uh, Rebecca Mellinson from Mississippi State. She has a very nice publication, uh, Common Diseases of Tomatoes. I would recommend Googling that publication. It's, uh, on the Mississippi State website, Common Diseases of Tomatoes. We're revising ours, and uh, but Rebecca has done a nice job with that, and it gives you some very helpful information. It also talks about some of the fungicides that you might be uh, spending time with. Okay, and with that, I'll stop. Uh,
Again, I'm Ed Zakor, Extension Plant Pathologist. You could send me an email if you like. There's my cell phone number. Um, and if you really want to learn things, follow me on Twitter at Alabama Ed. I, I post something just about every day and it might concern soybeans one day, tomatoes the next, trees and so on. But I, I try and be informative when I'm doing this. And uh, if you follow me, I think you'll learn a lot.